So hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Griffin. Welcome to the HamptonRoads.net users group. I am so glad you're here. I'm joined by my partner in crime, Drew Carpenter. Hey, Drew. Hey, Drew was just telling us about his uh, awesome clock project uh, built out of electronics and LEDs and all that good stuff. Um, so that's, uh, that's actually really fascinating. You should do a more proper uh, presentation on that because I would love to learn more. Uh, but we're also joined by Lee Richardson. Lee, how are you? You're muted. Yes, I'm muted. Uh, I'm doing great, Kevin. How are you doing? Good. Uh, so uh, I've known Lee for years. Um, Lee's up in the Northern Virginia area. So uh, Lee, I'm trying to remember, have you been down to the, our physical user group? I'm trying to remember if you've been down to us. No, I haven't. But as soon as I get someone to stick a needle in my arm, I promise I will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm one for two. Uh, I get my, yes. my next shot in two weeks. So I'll be, I'll be uh, fully vaccinated. Right. And, you know, maybe uh, closer to the end of the year, we can start having in-person events again. Um, I was excited because I've signed up for three conferences, like three in-person conferences today, um, later this year. So I'm, I might actually get to see people and, and that just, that makes me really happy. Um, but I'm trying to we, decide whether to do the Nova Code Camp in in person or online. Um, it's going to be in probably in late September, early October, and it's like everyone should be okay by then. I, I don't know. A good percentage of folks should be vaccinated by then. Um, but really, for you, isn't that up to Microsoft since they're your venue? Um, that's a, they that's allow a good point. people in <laughs> RTC. Uh, that's a really yeah. point. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. I would love to go. I haven't been up in Northern Virginia for a while. So I'd love to come back up there, um, especially in person. Uh, nothing against virtual events. I like virtual events, but man, I am burnt out on virtual events. <laughs> just talking to a camera, it, it will just really take it out of you. Uh, but Lee, today you're going to talk to us about Blazor, uh, which I don't think anyone's talked about at our user group in a while. So we're interested in hearing that and comparing, I guess, comparing it to Angular uh, for client-side developments. Um, this was the number one choice of HR Nug people in our uh, local Slack. So I think uh, that's why we went with it. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And I'll watch the Twitch chat for, uh, for any questions that might pop up. So everyone on Twitch land, thank you for showing up. Uh, Lee, you should be able to share your screen and it's all yours. All right. Let's make this go away. Yep, you're good. All right. So this is Blazor WebAssembly versus Angular. I hope it is a, a client-side shootout. So I'm gonna do a comparison of Blazor WebAssembly and Angular. I'm gonna do this in four parts. I'm gonna have a, quick intro, and then I'm going to talk about what is Blazor. So it's not a 101 level course, but I need to make sure everyone is up to a certain level before I can do uh, the shootout, which will be the main event. And before I do that, I'm going to do a demo. I'm going to show components and how components work in Blazor, assuming that you already have a certain level of familiarity with Angular. and uh, so the shootout will be across 10 different areas when I get to that, that part of the presentation. And then I'm gonna try to wrap it all up and, and put everything together in terms of a recommendation uh, for if you were to start a new project today, whether you would wanna do Blazor or Angular, which is hard to do, but I'll give it a shot. So real quick, my name is Lee Richardson. I'm a Microsoft MVP, I'm a writer, a speaker, a maker. I am on YouTube. I generally cover .NET and open source topics. I am also the author of Siren of Shame, which I have one around here, no? Uh, it's a, a fun little USB siren that you can plug in and uh, it connects up to some software which is constantly looking at your build server and whenever the build breaks, the lights go off and it goes wah, wah, wah. It's kind of a fun little thing. I make a tiny little bit of money on selling those and the software is open source and fun and free. 
I work at Inferno Red Tech, great company. If you are uh, looking for work, they are always looking for great talent. Shoot me a message. I'm on Twitter, YouTube, blog at leerichardson.com, so on and so forth. So I've always been excited about Blazor since the first time I heard about it. And I thought uh, maybe this would be a good time to write a game because I've never written a game. And I also had a problem where my daughter who is was 12 at the time was learning to type and I wanted to encourage her to become a better typer. And so I thought what better way to, to combine all of these things than to write a simple little game that's a typing game. And this is based on something that my wife and I used to play decades ago where you, you dot your diver and you dive and, and you try to type the sharks and it's like competition. Uh, super fun. I just thought I'd make it for the 21st century and make it multiplayer and cooperative. So you can have multiple people join in and it works with SignalR, which Kevin, I'm sure you'll be happy to hear. And so you can either play in single player mode or you can play in multiplayer mode cooperative. And it looks kind of like this. Oops. And feel free to feel free to jump on over here if you want. Typershark.io is live for now until I take it down. And you just uh, you just type the sharks and it shows your points up here. It's real simple. I'm I'm obviously not a game developer. Or you can play multiplayer. So this can be in a row. Oh, I've already typed that in once. All right. So if anyone else feels like joining in, you can jump over to typershark.io and you ought to be able to see this game. And so I could wait here for a second and see if anyone else joins and we could hunt sharks together. Hey, Drew, awesome. And Kevin, all right. So yep, someone else is typing toes, many, sore, paid. Yeah, awesome. So there you go. So now that I've entirely lost my uh, audience, <laughs> we're trying to bring it back to the presentation. So this is based on my experiences building this. That's my experience with Blazor. And then my daytime job is doing uh, maintaining an Angular app. So comparing those two technologies, I wrote an application. I wrote a, an article on Code Project, which was well received. And if you're interested in some of the details, you can check out that article. So that's kind of a little bit of the background about what this presentation is based on. So what is Blazor? Or as my daughter asked when she came in, I was preparing this slide, she's like, Dad, what is Blazor? And being a dad, I had to be like, well, kiddo, I'm sure you remember the Hobbit movies, right? That was, that was the bad guy from the, the Hobbit movies. He was Blazor the Defiler, which every time I see the words Blazor, now I'm always thinking Blazor. Uh, but no, it's uh, nothing to do with the Hobbits. It is about building client applications in C Sharp and specifically web apps in C Sharp. So it's a SPA, single page application. So I'm gonna cover what it is. It has two execution models, server side and client side. I'll be talking about those. I'll be talking about what WebAssembly is and then kind of going over some of the features. In terms of a history, it is relatively new. It was released with .NET Core 3 in September of 2019, and version five was released in 2020 last year. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, that was, sorry, that was Blazor Server that was released in 2019. So Blazor WebAssembly is, is much newer. That was only released uh, in mid 2020. And then Blazor 5 was released in late 2020. So this is a, a very young technology. By comparison, Angular has been around a long time. So it almost feels like it's not com fair to compare these two technologies, but they are solving roughly similar problems. And, and in the Wild West, it doesn't really matter who's the, you know, the new kid on the block and who's the, the old person, you know, all that matters is who's got the quickest draw, right? Pow, pow. So hopefully we will figure that out in tonight's presentation. So server-side versus client-side. This is the way that the server-side model works. And so you can see that your C-sharp code lives up here on the server. 
And when somebody requests information, requests the page, it sends a render tree down into the UI thread on the browser. And that UI thread then updates the DOM. And as the user interacts with the application, maybe clicks a button or types into a text box or whatever, then events fire back. And in this server-side execution model, these events get sent back up through SignalR onto a server. And the C-sharp compiled code then figures out what the UI diff is. Blazor does this for you. And it sends just the diff back down. And then the UI thread updates the DOM with just the parts that have changed. By comparison, the client side Blazor looks actually very similar. And you'll see that there is, uh, you know, the only difference is that your, your C sharp is living in the browser. And so there is, there's still a render tree and there's still the UI diffs that happen. And this is, uh, yeah, so this is the difference from client side and server side. And yeah, okay, <laughs> we'll leave it at there. So normally this is an interactive presentation. I'm gonna give it a try with the chat. Uh, we have a couple of people on the chat that are game for giving this, a, giving this a shot. So here's a question for you. Given the limited information that I've provided so far, which do you think is going to have the better file size uh, in terms of like the initial load when you download that first file, if you're running in server side mode or client side mode for Blazor? Yeah, one Jeff M, you are correct. The, the, the server side will be smaller because the client side is going to need to download the entire .NET framework. And downloading the entire .NET framework is cool, but it is uh, gonna be bigger. So which one's gonna give you offline support? Should be easy, easier question here. Yeah, uh, you are correct. The with the uh, client side model gives you better, uh, gives you offline support. The server side, it, all of the clients need to continually connect back up to the server in order to execute the C-sharp code. So when you click a button or whatever, that event is sent up via SignalR. So it, it necessarily, server side mode necessarily can never be offline. So if you have a mobile app and someone's driving through a tunnel and they're in server side execution model of Blazor, it's just gonna time out. Uh, it's not going to, it's going to stop working. How about uh, scalability? Which one is going to be able to support more clients, more, more end users? I'll give you a hint. Has, it's very closely related to which one has offline support. <laughs> All right. The answer is uh, that the client side does. The scalability is going to be substantially better in client side because it has offline support. So one of the kind of interesting consequences of the server side execution model of Blazor is that you have every single client that ever connects up to the server, the server has to maintain the DOM for them. And that that client's very specific DOM, because as they make changes, it needs to be able to send diffs back down. And so in memory on that server is every single client that's currently connected versus, first of all, a signal our connection back down to them, but second of all, their DOM state. So you might intuitively think, oh man, server side's gotta have like terrible performance. It's gotta just kill your server. And you know, how can you have multiple servers? Uh, they've taken care of that. Um, it, it's apparently not, not so bad. It, it really, the, according to the specs, the server side execution model of Blazor can scale quite well, but not as well as the client side. How about the API size? Which of the server side and the client side is going to have a better API? The answer is uh, yes. No, the, the server side actually. Uh, Jeff M, the server side will have a better API. And the reason is that the client side, that code is living in the client. And so it has all of the limitations of a web browser. It, it can't connect to, it can't write to the local file system. It, it has web sockets, Swampy Fox, you're right. It does have web sockets, you can do that, but you can't just open a random socket and start writing to it. You can't connect to a database. And so consequently the server side model has, uh, has, 
uh, entity framework built in. So you have full entity framework if you're running the server side version of Blazor. And that is that can be extremely compelling. That can be a, a, a real compelling reason to use server side. Uh, any guesses on which one's going to have a better debugging experience? The answer is both. It's gotten better, but the client side is, is pretty mediocre. And I will demonstrate some of this later. I didn't give you enough information to really be able to make a good guess on that. How about browser support? Not IE. Um, actually, believe it or not, server side does support IE. So I would give uh, I would give server side this uh, the uh, the browser support check mark. And the reason is client side doesn't support IE. It doesn't support older browsers because it needs to have um, uh, uh, web WebAssembly support, which I'll get into in a little bit. So um, don't want to. Microsoft doesn't even support IE anymore. Uh, they do for they do actually for server side uh, version of Blazor. So let's just uh, don't want to jump too far ahead, but let's you know, since I've already got this slide up, compare to Angular. How is the file size going to be for Angular? Is it going to be comparable to the client side or the server side version of Blazor? Um, the answer is. It's going to have a great file size. Angular's, uh, they do a great job with that. Um, <laughs> uh, how about offline support? Offline support also works with Angular, definitely. There's no server component necessary for Angular. So you got that. How is the scalability for Angular? It's fantastic. Uh, here's a weird question. How is the API size? If you had to compare the API size of client side or server side Angular, is it closer to the client side or the server side? Kind of a weird question, right? Because the answer is uh, that you don't have access to connect to a database. So I, I guess it's more like client side, but it's kind of weird to even suggest that you might get entity framework in Angular. So kind of a weird question. How about the debugging experience? Do you guys like the debugging experience for, uh, for Angular? Any Angular folks out there like the debugging experience? That's quiet. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I feel. It's okay. I mean, I put a check mark there, but debugging Angular is eh, it's fine. I'll tell you what's great though. The debugging experience in server side Blazor is really good. This is a, should be a much bigger check mark, I think. Lastly, browser support. Angular, believe it or not, still supports Internet Explorer. So if that matters to you, and it does matter to some people, then uh, you know Angular, good for you. All right, let's get into the details of WebAssembly. First of all, what is it? Well, it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Duh. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know what does what does that mean? I don't really know. Uh, this is what the this is what the doc officially looks like. By the way, um, I got this from uh, Microsoft Blazor building web applications in .NET Second Edition by. Peter Hemshoot. This is a book I read in preparation for this presentation, which is uh, it's a pretty good, it's an okay book. And I put all my references down in the bottom, but I also put them at the end of the presentation. So I'll get back to those if you want to get a screenshot of all the references. So in a traditional JavaScript model, the way that the world works these days, the modern world, is that you have the file is file.js is hosted by a server. And the browser goes and makes a request. Says, hey, can I get file.js? It downloads the JavaScript file. It parses the JavaScript file. It actually compiles it and turns it into bytecode. And then there's a JIT compiler, which compiles just the pieces of it that are being executed. So it won't, it won't JIT all of it at once. It just does the JIT of the, well, just in time, just the bits that it needs. And that way, it doesn't need to compile absolutely everything. And you get better performance that way. By comparison, if you have a WebAssembly file that lives on the server, and it could be any language, it could be C Sharp, it could be Java, it could be Python. There's compilers for a ton of different languages, and they will turn language files and compile them into .wasm files. These WASM files, which are binary, are then requested by the browser in a WebAssembly 
model. And you get to bypass the parsing, the compiling, and the turning into bytecode stages, and you jump directly into the JIT compiler. And that has some interesting consequences. So uh, for one thing, you don't, you, you know, there's a huge performance uh, increase in just by being able to skip all of this, but you actually get additional instructions available to you in WebAssembly that you don't even have access to in the JavaScript world, which is kind of cool. So what does a uh, WebAssembly file looks like? I got this from an article by Jeremy Likeness, which I recommend that you check out, but I took out just the interesting bits. This was an example where he wrote in C a program which will look through a string array and test for a given character, see if that character exists in there. And so he's got a little while loop. And if he finds it, then if he doesn't find it, then he returns negative one. And if he does find it, he returns the location. And this gets turned into the following WebAssembly language. I am not going to bore you with the details, if I could even understand it. But I think the interesting thing to notice there is how low level that WebAssembly is. It basically looks kind of like assembly. It's, it's loading things into registers and doing comparisons and uh, things like that. So it's, it's very low level. So my Typer Shark application that I wrote, if you fire up Fiddler and you watch that, you're probably going to, I might have expected a whole bunch of WASM files, but it doesn't really work like that. There's actually only one. And you zip in here and it's .NET.WASM. And instead of seeing a whole bunch of WASM files or one gigantic WASM file, instead, I'm seeing all these DLLs. And it's like, why are there all these DLLs? How does that make any sense? I thought this was Blazor WebAssembly. Instead, it looks like it's Blazor DLL assembly or something like that. It's kind of weird. So my file here that my library is uh, this, but then there's also system.txt.encoding and system.txt.json, system.net.http.dll. What the heck is going on? The answer is, uh, is, is defined in this great article by Rick Strahl that I recommend you read. It's a little bit dated. You can see it's from 2018. Oh, every time I move the cursor, it overwrites it, but it, it's from 2018. And he describes the way that Blazor works. And by the way, if, if this is too low level for you, if you don't care about these details, I'm gonna get back higher level again. I, I find this kind of stuff interesting. I don't know if you all do too. So um, the, the way that this works is you have Razor files, .cshtml files, and your, your C sharp files. And those get turned into a DLL, which I just showed in the previous slide, and are compiled in uh, .NET standard. Then you've got the system assemblies, which I just showed, and also the NuGet imports. All of these things are DLLs, and they are loaded by what used to be called mono.wasm, is now called .net.wasm, which is basically a hosting mechanism. It hosts these DLL files and knows how to run them. And then that gets executed uh, with the JavaScript interop. Oh, and the JavaScript interop is, is a part of that, which I'll show later. And so you actually don't get native WebAssembly performance with Blazor WebAssembly, counterintuitively. Um, instead, you're going to have your DLLs executed. And this is one of the benefits that is going to come out with .NET, with the next version of .NET. When that, when that .NET 6 uh, hits, that version of Blazor has a feature called AOT, ahead of time compilation. And uh, I've seen a couple of demos of this. It looks really cool. I haven't played with it yet, but it is coming down the, the pipe and it's worth paying attention to. It will take your files here and instead of compiling them into a DLL, you can compile them directly into a WebAssembly file and get native performance. That doesn't exist today, but it is on its way. Worth keeping an eye open for. So WebAssembly benefits, first of all, goodbye JavaScript, hello, pretty much any other language. I mean, I've come to terms with JavaScript. I don't, I don't hate it. I, I do like um, uh, TypeScript. TypeScript is nice, but I love C Sharp. And if you're in the uh, .NET Hampton Roads user group, I'm guessing that you perhaps also love C Sharp. And so you can relate to that. The other benefits are it is faster than JavaScript. And in fact, you can get near native performance. And the word native in this context means basically C or C++ level of performance. 
um, order of magnitudes faster startup time than ASM.js. ASM.js was a technology that uh, used to exist for um, uh, compiling C and C++ code down to JavaScript. So that's cool. And there's actually more instructions available than the JavaScript language. <laughs> come to come to terms with JavaScript, yeah. Okay, so that's that's getting into the weeds a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back out a little bit and talk about the features that you get with Blazor. So, um, first of all, yeah, Blazor sits on top of WebAssembly, and it, it it's giving you a whole bunch of features, including Razor syntax and components, and .NET Framework, and, and layouts, and data binding, and interop, and dependency injection, and .NET standard, uh, all these things. Let's just dig into this a little bit. First of all, you get Razor files. And if I haven't mentioned it before, which I don't think I have, the word Blazor is a combination of the words browser and Razor. And, and Razor are these, these files and this kind of weird, um, maybe it's not weird, maybe it's intuitive to you, but this mixing of C Sharp and HTML. So you can see right here, there's a, a header and here's a paragraph and directly embedded is a, a variable, a C-sharp variable. And this, by the way, is the standard demo that Microsoft always gives. Every Blazor presentation seems to, to give this and I'm not going to give it much attention because it, it, it bores me, but um, I don't know. <laughs> If you can, if you do a file new project, you might as well get used to it because this is what you see when you when you do a file new project for Blazor. Um, any guesses uh, in terms of what it does? Should be should be straightforward enough. It's just got a whoa. Sorry. There we go. There we go. All right. Whew, recovered. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a counter. Good call. Good call. Well done, Swampy Fox. You read the H1. Uh, so yeah, there's a button on here and there's an at on click. And when you when you click the button over here, it jumps down to this event. It jumps down to this method in C sharp. Yes, and it logs. Yes, well, well spotted. Well spotted as the British would say. I work with the British on a daily basis. Uh, and this is not part of the standard demo. I actually threw this in because I thought it was interesting. So yeah, it increments the count and then so a couple things to, to just point out. One, there is data binding as part of this. So this at current count is bound to this value down here. And anytime this value down here changes, it's automatically reflected in the UI. That's one way data binding. It also has support for two way data binding, which is a slightly different syntax that I won't get into just now. There is also routing built in to Blazor. And so this at page directive says, hey, whenever anybody navigates in the URL to, in, in the browser's URL to slash counter, then go to this uh, page. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, yeah, so .NET Framework, as pointed out by Swampy Fox, this is using the, the iLogger framework from .NET. And what's kind of cool about this is that iLogger, oops, is that iLogger is something that um, can be implemented in a variety of different ways. And in the Blazor world, it goes to the console. So when you do logger.log information, it does an info to the browser's console, which is cool. Dependency injection in Razor, in Blazor is a first class citizen. And so that's, that's really nice. If you are used to the Microsoft of uh, your a uh, long time ago, uh, dependency injection might have been a, a foreign concept, but today's Microsoft uses interfaces and dependency injection and everything is unit testing friendly. That is really nice. I'll get into this when I do the demo. Uh, also, it supports components like you would expect from any modern spa. There's just no other way that you can build up a complicated UI front end application without being able to break and modularize your uh, your UI and everything and break it down into small little components. So this is what I'll be doing a demo on later. All right, let us talk about interop. Interop is an important concept because if you are doing any interactions with any third party JavaScript libraries, you're pretty much going to have to do interop. 
in the Blazor world. So there is a nice Pluralsight course from Thomas Claudier Huber. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. I probably should have checked with him somehow um, on Pluralsight that I recommend. Another thing that I watched in preparation for this presentation. So this is how to call from JavaScript into C Sharp. There is an object on the global window scope called .NET that Blazor adds. And all you need to do is call .NET .invoke method async. You pass as your first parameter, the DLL, that you want to uh, invoke something in. And your second parameter, you pass in a mm, sort of a magic string. And as all of your subsequent parameters are all of the uh, pr uh, parameters for going into that method. So this is the thing which is being invoked and uh, you put in an attribute, JS invocable. And once you throw in that attribute, then the JS key press is what gets exposed. And you can actually customize that. And then all of the subsequent arguments are what is getting passed as, as parameters. And Blazor will automatically marshal those between C Sharp and JavaScript. I haven't had any marshaling problems where I've had to do anything fancy yet. It just, just all works generally. So. And it's all async. Everything's async friendly. So that's kind of cool. Ooh. All right. C sharp to JavaScript. If you're in the C sharp world and you need to uh, throw something, you just ask for an IJS runtime, which you inject. It gets passed to you somehow. And then you can await JS runtime dot invoke async and you can call anything. You can call alert and hi, and this will pop up a little alert dialog box. So that is interop in a nutshell. Also, you get layouts. So this is another Pluralsight course that uh, was good. I recommend it from Jill Clarine, Clarine. And in it, he shows how to have like a, you have like a layout area and a content. And as you click different things over here, the content area changes. So layouts is something which is supported by Blazor. And lastly, NuGet. This is incredible that this works. I just, I sometimes it just kind of still blows my mind, but you can, anything which is .NET Standard 2 compatible that's in NuGet, you can just pull it down and run it in the browser. How cool is this? So if you have a favorite component that you, that you like using, it's uh, something you can just bring down and it'll run in the browser. Cool. So that about covers my Blazor overview. However, hopefully, hopefully everyone's kind of up to speed well enough on that. Um, before I go do a demo, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any, not seeing any questions. All right, I'm gonna jump right to demo. So this is, wow, this is huge. I got a 4K monitor here and I, whenever I give it presentations, I try to uh, take it down to a really small resolution um, so that I'm not pumping out a ton of pixels over the internet, but wow, this is really big. Okay. <laughs> um, Enough of that. So this is the Typer Shark application, which I was talking about. If I control F5 and run this right now, this is going to be on my local host and I can start a game and I can type in some, some things or I can start the multiplayer, which I showed earlier. Um, nothing we haven't seen before. And the way this works is Let's see, let's jump down to, there's a, there's a program.cs. So that's the thing that actually starts everything. And then there's a, um, I don't know, it, it's a couple of things, it bounces around a couple of different things and eventually it gets into pages and it gets to index.cs and index.razor. So if I jump over to index.razor, you'll see, ooh, is that a little better? Um, you'll see that there is a little bit of code that says, okay, if this multiplayer variable is defined, then show this component. If it's uh, true, then show this all stuff. And if it's false, then show this. 
So this, first of all, is, uh, it's, it's ugly. It would be really nice if this were at the very least one component. So now you are, you've got, uh, everything's at a roughly similar level of um, abstraction. So what I'm gonna try to do in this demo is take all this code and plunk it into uh, a separate component. So first of all, let's just prove that this is real here. Um, right off the bat, if I just hit save, you see there's a star up here. And if I hit save right now, and I alt tab back over to my local host and hit re refresh, because I did a control F5, I don't have to recompile. And that's kind of nice. Got my hello. So that's generally the way I'm gonna be doing a lot of my work because it, it works pretty fast. It is not as fast as Angular. Um, even with this little trick of hitting control F5 and running without debugging. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, let's try to add a new component. Uh, the difference between pages and components is virtually nothing. The only difference is whether you have an app page directive. So uh, it's, it's a little weird maybe to have pages and components as two separate folders, but that's how I've uh, come to prefer doing things. If I were a student to start a new project, that's what I would do. So I'm gonna create a new Razor component here and we'll call this the player name component. I don't know if this is idiomatic yet. I haven't read too much other Razor, but I, I do this in Angular where if something is a component, I end it with the word component. So I'm gonna follow my, my Angular conventions. Someone chime in if I'm doing it wrong, <laughs> more pixels. Uh, yeah, so let's see, we've got a player name component. Let's just see if we can include that. Let's see if we can get anything here. The way to include a component is just to put it like it's an HTML attribute. So player name component. I'm gonna save this. And what do you think? Is it gonna work? Probably not. There's already some squigglies there. So that's a bad sign. Uh, hmm. Well, it, it didn't complain as loudly as I was expecting. Maybe I need to actually recompile. Should have, com should have compiled, complained at some point. How about now? <laughs> it thinks it's an HTML component. That's why it's, that's why there's no compiler errors. So anyway, what it wants is it wants a using directive. So I could do an at using, and include the DLL's name, type check two, which is type sharp two. It's a typo that I made a long time ago and I've never gotten around to fixing it. Uh, client dot components. And that ought to be enough to get this to work. Let's I've saved it. Let's see, hopefully I don't need to compile. Let's see what happens. Hey, there we go. We picked up the player name component. Now, that's great, that's, that's good, but all of these components, we're gonna to want to include them on every single page. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just put all of our global usings in one place? Yes, that would be wonderful. Fortunately, there's this underscore imports.razor where you can put all of your using statements. So now I'm, in, I'm including the typescript2.clients.components on every single page. So that's kind of nice. What's next? Let's try to move all of this code into that component. I jump over here to the player name component. And, oh, yep, here we go. These are the exceptions that I have come to know and love. Blazor is still at this point kind of buggy. I mean, you know, it could be ReSharper that's messing me up or some third party thing, but. Something somewhere is failing, and it only happens when I'm in Blazor world. So we're close to this working. It doesn't have a temp player, and I could I could come over here and put it in the at code section, and that's kind of the way all of the examples are. But I don't know. It just feels a little bit icky to me to to combine all of my C sharp and my UI in the same file. Call me old fashioned, but I just like to have those in separate files. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. The way to do that is, well, I guess you get rid of your code block. 
there's no, unfortunately, there's no good at the moment way of doing this in your IDE. You just have to go in and create a new class. By the way, I forgot to mention this. I'm doing this in Visual Studio, but you could do it in VS Code, or probably you could do it in VS for Mac. I don't know. I, maybe someone can fact check me on that. The name of this class needs to match exactly with the file name that I did here. So it needs to be called player name component. Like that. And if I go to and try to compile it right now, you're going to see that it's unhappy because it says, hey, there's already a class called player name component, which me might be like, that's weird. Why would there be two player name components? Well, the answer is that behind the scenes, all of these razor files get compiled down into classes that live in a hidden directory. And if you're interested in seeing that hidden directory, if you like to know how things work behind the scenes, which I always do, then you can hunt around over here in the obj directory and you can go to debug, you can go to .NET 5, and then you can go into, let's see, there should be a oh, razor and then components. And here we go. There's a hidden player name component.razor.g.cs. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's just poke around a little bit for fun. Yeah, it is. It's a partial class, conveniently enough. Well spotted, Jeff uh, So, yeah, if I jump right down here to the bottom, you'll see that it's a public partial class player name component. So, conveniently enough, that uh, that file that I started creating that it complained and gave a compiler error about, I can, all I need to do is throw a partial on it. And now I'm extending this weird generated component. And you'll notice a lot of uh, directives, compiler directives in here, and that helps with the debugging, presumably. I don't know, I haven't dug that far into it, but I think it's interesting. I mean, the fact that it gives you line numbers is, is pretty suggestive that that's for uh, debugging purposes. Interestingly, you can almost pretend that that doesn't exist, except every once in a while, I've found cases where I've got code in here and I'm in the debugger world, and all of a sudden I pop up in this file. And, and if, you're not, if you're not expecting, it's like, what? What the heck is going on? Like, can you imagine if you're just like merrily debugging along, all of a sudden you end up in a file like, I don't know, maybe not that, but let's take a look at like a more complicated one, like the actual game page. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's a mess. Like what? what is all this it's it's closing an element and adding an attribute and blah so um it's worth knowing because you might end up being inadvertently exposed to it okay back to back to the underlying story which was sorry this is object directory okay player back to the player name component so all i need to do is fix it just to add a partial Now it's going temp player is. So I can just copy that over from my previous project that was in the index, that was under pages, index.cs. And over here, I had a temp player. What is it? That doesn't even really matter that much. It's a thing. Okay, but I do need to have an event. It's about to complain. If I were to jump over into the razor file, it's going to complain that on submit, and I haven't even talked about this code yet, which I will do in just a second, but it's it's looking for an event called set name. Oh, sorry, it's looking for a method called set name. So there we go. Now we've got our set name, and now the razor should be happy. No more red. That's that's good. Great, I like that. Now, what is this? What is this context.player? I'm going to try and migrate that over. And I'll see that in my previous file, I, I had this context object. This is something I created for storing state. I just have a global game context object. And on it, I store the current player or the current players and how many sharks outstanding there are and how many letters you've typed. It's just sort of the overall state of the game. And this object, I've asked it to be injected. And uh, so I could, I could just copy this over 
into the player name component like that. And now everything's going to compile. Now you might be asking, well, where did this even get defined in terms of how, how did I uh, tell the dependency injection system that that's a thing? That happens in program.cs. So all of the registration happens here and it looks generally something like this. I said, I want, I want a singleton. Anytime you see an iGame context, well, the, actually what I'm saying, because I did a singleton, I'm saying the first time you see an iGame context, I want you to instantiate a game context. And all subsequent times that you see an iGame context, I want you to return the single game context that I had, that I had previously, previously created. So that's the way that works. Incidentally, uh, I don't do a lot of HTTP because I'm using SignalR for this particular application. Maybe I do a little bit of it because I left it in here, but uh, this is how you would register an HTTP client and you can put in a base address. So that's, um, that's how you would do that if you need to. Back to my tiny little example, I'm going to, let's try to compile this and see what happens. Okay, build succeeded is good. Refresh this and, oh, hey, that looks pretty good. Uh, we're back, it's working again. MK isn't doing anything though. So let's see what happened. We, it, well, I guess question number one is did it even get into set name? And, and I can show you debugging right now, just so we can you know, test this out and see if it works. I'm gonna hit F5 and you'll see the very nice debugging support that you get, or at least, I think better than Angular's. Oh, yes. Look at that. My, my breakpoint hit. Isn't that nice? And I can see that I have a player DTO object and I typed an SDS, SDF in it. So, so that was working. So it did actually get set. So why in the parent object in the index.razor because you remember we're saying this, if context.player.name is not equal to null, then we should have gone, this should have all disappeared and this should have reappeared. Well, uh, if you know a little bit about Razor thus far, you might be saying, well, I need to, I need to tell the UI to go update itself. And this is something that you occasionally need to know about when you are doing interop especially. So right now, the game itself, uh, I don't want to pull it up, but the game itself, when you type letters on the keyboard, that is a JavaScript object. I'm, I'm capturing the keyboard events in a JavaScript object because at least when I wrote this application, which I, incidentally I wrote as a server app and I had to convert it to a um, Blazor uh, WebAssembly project. And let me just tell you, if, if you are thinking, oh, I'll just write it as a, a one and convert it to the other. The code is so similar. You could almost like not even tell whether you're in server-side execution model or client-side execution model, but that migration is very painful because it changes your architecture substantially. So I had to go through this pain and it was, it was really not pleasant. I basically had to create a whole new project and migrate over all of my code. The migration was pretty easy at that point, but, um, your architecture changes too. So, um, all right, enough, enough about that. Um, so the interop that I was talking about happens in the game.cs here. So this is where the sharks all live. And here's my on key press, which I'm invoking from C sharp. And let's see, I invoke a sync to make sure that I don't have any problems there. And then here we go. This is state has changed. So this is a magical method that exists on all components that says, hey, something's changed that you probably don't know about. Go like recheck all of your DOM elements and make sure that they match up. And that is part of what makes the performance of Blazor pretty good, that it only changes things that it needs to. It's basically like a shadow DOM. Um, but sometimes it can get a little bit out of sync, especially when doing interop. So it's tempting to think, well, I probably need one of those uh, over in my player name component. Okay, go tell everybody to, in fact, I'll wait this. Nope. 
Oh, I don't have to await it. All right, all I have to do is compile it. And it's going to compile now. Ah, yes, freelance word. Compiling this to a mobile app is actually um, something which is, is liable to happen in .NET 6 with, um, uh, with all of the MAUI stuff. So if you take a look at the uh, .NET Conf episode um, from a couple months ago, they have a really cool demo where they show taking all of the Blazor stuff and embedding it in a, a WebAssembly component inside of a what used to be called um, Xamarin, but is now going to be called Maui, and it's just like an, an attribute. And then you can compile this directly into mobile apps. Some really cool technology. I don't have time to, to demonstrate this, but uh, it's it's on it's on the on the way. So keep an eye open for that. Coming down the pike soon. Okay, so I was going to compile this. I'm going to control F5 it and. What do you all think? Is this going to work? Type this now. It should work, right? No, it still didn't work. And the thing here is the reason this still didn't work is because this nested component, the parent, will never update its UI because there is no com explicit communication between child components and parent components unless you explicitly make that happen. So, this is what I really should have done to begin with because we don't like side effects, right? Side effects are, uh, I don't know, it's a very, very Java-esque way of doing things. It would be much cleaner to have this be all nice and clean. You just pass something in and get something back out. It's how I probably should have written this to begin with. I probably should never have injected a context object in here. So I'm gonna do an event. I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna make a public event. Uh, I think it's called event callback. And we could say, uh, this takes a player DTO. This returns a player DTO. This is on player set. You don't mind the sort of roundabout route that I'm taking to get to this. Hopefully you're learning something along the way. So then I can on player name set dot invoke async and I can pass in a player and I can take this code over here and plunk this back into the index.razor.cs. And oh, actually, we should go over to the razor file and the player name component. Hopefully, oh, okay, hang on. If I compile, hopefully, the IntelliSense will take over. Ooh. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what, I didn't put in an attribute. There's an attribute that I need to make this be an attribute, what's it called? Parameter, it's called parameter. Obviously, I want it to be a parameter. Now I bet, there we go. On player name set equals player on set. I don't know, it's terrible naming. Okay, and create a property now, just do it by hand. So we're gonna have a public, actually I think it can be private. Void for now. That and I'm gonna paste in that code. Oops. Do you guys know about this trick? Uh, in Windows, you can do Windows V to show your clipboard history. It's turned on, but I love this feature. And I've probably just exposed a bunch of passwords that I've had in my clipboard to uh, to the world. So what is posture check? Um, okay, so um, now what is temp player? Oh, well, I need to pass that as a parameter. So that was a player, DTO, player, something like that. I am doing a using for that. Compile, and I don't know, what do you guys think? Is this gonna work finally? Yay, it worked. Fantastic. And actually, we didn't need the state has changed after all. So I save that, recompile it, and there we go. It worked just fine. All right. Well, that concludes my demo. Hopefully, I didn't bore you all. I don't know what that posture check is. I feel like I need to stand up straighter and show doing this all right. All right. 
it is time for the main event. It is time for the shootout. So let's talk view typing. View typing is this world where I just showed you, you get all this great uh, IntelliSense and compiler errors. So this was the code that I showed you earlier. And I didn't really dig into it very much, but there is an edit form, which is the equivalent in HTML world of saying, I want a form, but this edit form is strongly typed. And so the event on valid submit equals set name is going to an object in C sharp. And if I mistype it, I get a compiler error. If I refactor it down the road and change the name of something, maybe it was in some you know, parent class and it'll cascade and give me compiler errors everywhere. Same thing for, this is an input text. It's the equivalent of saying input type equals text, but I'm doing a bind value to temp player dot name. And it is giving me again, a compiler typing on that. So the equivalent, uh, the, the end result is what's your name, but you end up getting, if you mistype things, you get immediate feedback, which is just something you don't get in Angular. So I'm a huge fan of that. The equivalent in Angular looks something like this. And I did actually write up a very simple version of the typer shark in application in, in Angular. And, you know, quick, quick, take a look at this. Is there a compiler error? Eh, there might be, and you can eventually get it. I think if you ng build minus minus prod minus minus AOT, and if you do that exact syntax, it really digs in in detail and it'll look for compiler errors in your Angular, but it takes a really long time to run. It takes so long that I only ever do it on my CI CD server. And I don't know, it's a, it's a pain. So uh, uh, Blazor definitely gets the win in this category. Um, so this is, yeah, this is what the Angular world gives you, generally speaking, when you have an error and you mistype something like that. So that's why I give Blazor the win for view typing. Go Blazor. Next up, component level CSS. So let's see, this is what the Angular world looks like. And I said, I wanted a style URL. I don't know if you saw in that previous example, but yeah, re yeah, what Jeff and I agree. Refactoring always gets me too, since the HTML template doesn't pick up the change, agreed. Uh, so this is a style URLs where I'm, I'm saying, pull in in Angular, the add player component dot SCSS. The equivalent in the, uh, so, okay, first of all, um, SAS and less support is built right in an Angular and you can have component level CSS. You can have a CSS file, which is just specific to that one component. In the old days, I felt like we used to have these giant CSS files that were for the entire application and everything that might possibly be, and it was a maintenance disaster. You ended up with stale CSS classes that just were never ever going to be used and it was awful. Component level CSS is like the best thing ever and that is something that you get. It's a, it's a first class citizen in Angular. Blazor does have CSS isolation. They added that in version five, so it's actually only a couple months old. Um, but it requires recompiling and the SAS and less support are not even supported out of the box. You have to include a third party component. You go look for the uh, like SAS builder, I think it's called. If you go into NuGet, you can pull down the SAS builder and it'll inject itself into the, it'll inject itself into the build process. But you, again, you have to recompile to get that feature. You can't just save and view the changes the way you do in Angular. And you can't just save and view the changes the way you could with a global laser. So um, I would still give Angular the win for this for now. 
Um, there are some changes coming in Blazor 6, which are going to make this a lot better. But for right now, Angular still gets the win. I used to complain very heavily. And if you look at the recorded version of this presentation that I have on YouTube, it's a little bit older. I released it when Blazor 3 was still a thing. And um, I was basically like, I won't even use Blazor at this point in time because it didn't have this feature. Now it has it, it's just not as great as I would like because I want to be able to make changes and see changes instantly, but it's good enough. You still don't have the maintenance. You've, you've removed the maintenance nightmare. So this is a win for, for Angular, but not a strong win for Angular anymore. Okay, let's talk a little bit about validation. So this is the Blazor world. And in this world, Take a look at the name field is required that came up down here. Where the heck did that come from? It came from this code, but, but nowhere did I actually say that the player name was required. The answer to that question is that it comes from this data annotations validator and it comes from data annotations. So my DTO object over here, I put in a required parameter. And so anytime that I have an edit form and I say my model is temp player, which is of type player DTO, then it knows to go in with reflection and pull up the required attribute, the string length attribute, the display name attribute, all of these things live on your data transfer objects. And that is really, really nice and clean. I love the way validation works. It just feels very natural to me in this kind of a, a world. By comparison, and it's not entirely fair, but when you start doing validation in Angular, as soon as you get any, any kind of more complicated validation, you really should be using reactive forms. And reactive forms, this was a validation that I wrote in my day job for uh, comparing a password field. I got a password and can type your password again and confirm it. And, um, you know, the equivalent of, of this would basically be just an attribute that you would put in a regex attribute in the on your data transfer object. Um, the equivalent here is just a little bit more complicated. It's also a little bit more powerful. You can do like subgroupings. You can say this is like a subform in Angular validation that you can't really do as well in uh, Blazor. But you know, in Blazor you get C sharp, right? So you can uh, I don't know that 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 almost makes it equal. Um, but uh, just the, the attribute style of, of validation, I, I love that so much that I would give Blazor the win in this category. All right, let's talk about tooling. So I don't know, just the sort of very first experience you get when you're generating a component, for example, in Angular, it's all command line based, but you do an ng generate component, my new component like this, and you right out of the box get an HTML and a TypeScript object and a CSS or lesser SAS if you define that in a, in a global file. And you get even a, a unit test all out of the box and it hooks them all up and, and everything just works together. It works so nicely. I love this experience in Angular and um, hopefully the IDE experience will be as strong in Visual Studio with Blazor, but it, it, for this, area, it's not. I mean, you saw the way I had to create a Blazor and then I had to create a new uh, C Sharp file that was parallel to it. And I had to add the word parallel to it. It's just not intuitive. It's not a great experience. Maybe it's not the end of the world, but little things like this add up, they matter. Uh, there's a, you know, IntelliSense, I guess, which is, um, that, that's, that's a really nice experience. The, the IntelliSense experience is really solid in Razor. Um, except when it isn't, sometimes it, it fails. You saw when I typed in an attribute earlier in my demo and it it didn't really know what that was. It, it couldn't figure it out. I thought, oh, that must be some HTML element I've never heard of before, but it's, it's great the vast majority of the time. Big fan of that. And as far as the tooling goes, this just makes my day in Angular. I love how insanely fast Angular is. When I make changes, that developer inner loop, I'm just immediately seeing changes back in the UI. And that just makes me able to move so much faster throughout my day. 
that is something in Angular that just makes me so happy. Having a fast developer inner loop for me is like one of the most important things that I can get with a platform. And Blazor doesn't have that today, but some of the demos that I'm seeing in Blazor 6 make it look um, like it's gonna be on par if, if not even better. But uh, I'm, I'm sticking to what, what Blazor has in Blazor 5 and Blazor today. And in, in that world, Angular definitely wins. Um, and then as far as tooling, you know, you end up, like I mentioned in the demo, you end up with this kind of stuff on your screen every once in a while. And it's like, whoa, what the heck is going on? Uh, it just feels a little, a little raw sometimes. So as far as tooling goes, I would give the win to Angular. Maturity, this is an easy, this is a quick one. I already talked about this. This is just this slide. And it's worth remembering in terms of maturity that if you choose a framework which is only a year old, you're gonna run into some rough edges. You just are, as opposed to a technology which has been around since you know, 2012. Um, well, maybe it's fair to say Angular 2 in 2016, but still. Uh, that's a that's a big difference. And so when you're getting into the weird edge cases of your framework, if you're working on a project that um, that does just normal things, if you're just doing normal things, building a, a forms over a business, what, what is it called? A forms over data kind of a, a project, you know, doesn't matter. This doesn't matter at all. But if you are liable to start getting into the weird edge cases, if you're do, doing video uh, rendering or, you know, you know, doing something low level with, with APIs, um, uh, you know, like GPS coordinates or something like that. I don't know. Um, I, I would be a little bit more reticent uh, in the Blazor world because you're, you're going to have a harder time finding a Stack Overflow post, which just tells you what the answer is in Blazor than you would in Angular. That said, anytime I had problems, I was able to find an answer pretty quick. There is a very passionate user base of people that are using Blazor and there is a lot of information out there and there's still a lot of people that are um, that are gonna be ready to jump jump in and help you. And that's that's really nice. But uh, you know it's it's the Angular community is going to be bigger. It just is. There's just, it's been around a long time and it's a huge community. So I do give Angular another win in this category just because edge cases. So let's see, let's talk about six. I, I, uh, I'm sure you all love XKCD like I do. So, hey, what are you doing? I just thought of a bad of opinion someone could have. And now I'm searching for it to so, see if someone does so I can be mad at them. Sounds like you have a healthy relationship with the internet. Hey, at least I'm not this guy that I just found. So yeah, this guy is liable to be me because I have very strong opinions about C Sharp and these are very opinion-based, this is a very opinion based category, but um, I don't know, I love C-sharp. And sometimes when I look at the most loved, dreaded, and wanted languages, I see C-sharp down there at number 10. And, uh, you know, it's below TypeScript. And, you know, JavaScript is almost equal to it. I'm like, what, what are all of these people thinking? Like C-sharp is so clearly the most awesome language. I, I just, like everything about it makes me so happy from the async to the way that it keeps growing and expanding and getting better and more functional. Like I just, I love all of these things. I love the, I love link, link to objects and link to SQL. All of those things are just brilliant and it doesn't, they don't have anything else in comparison as far as I know. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, so just to make this a little bit more concrete, this is some code that I would write in Angular to call into a backend service. And so I have a user service here. You can see that I'm calling up find all. And then finally, which is basically I'm saying, okay, regardless of whether you succeed or you failed, I want you to call this finish callback. It's like, okay, I get it. And then I want to subscribe to this call which is kind of weird because why am I subscribing to something I'm only calling once? And this is part of RxJS. Like RxJS is just a built-in necessary part of Angular. It's, it's idiomatic at this point. You could you don't have to do it, but it's it's like how you do Angular. Um, and I guess I guess that's okay. Like if, I don't know, 
when I, when you're doing like key events, I want to subscribe to key events. That makes sense. Like there's a whole bunch of things that might come back, but in this world, I am only ever calling user service to get all of my users once. So why should I have to subscribe as if there might be multiple calls that are coming back? I don't know. It's just the way that it works. And then, uh, now, this is the section of code where I'm assuming success and I'm doing something. And then this is uh, on error. If there was an error, now go do this. It's just, um, it's just a weird way of, of looking at the world. And if there's, any, uh, if there's anyone who's uh, online who's a big JavaScript person, you're like, well, you know, they do have async and await support, so you could do it that way. Um, and there's some truth to that. but. Um, I use NSWAG to, to, as a tool to auto-generate, on my day job, I auto-generate all of my backend service proxies. And it generates what I consider to be pretty idiomatic code. And this is the code that it generates for me for calling into my backend code. So I don't even really have the option of doing async in this, unless I guess I, I could do user service that find all. And I think you can convert it to an async object somehow. But by comparison, this is the same C sharp. And I don't know about you, but I just look at this and it's like, Oh, it makes sense. That's like the way the world should look. It's, this is what I'm doing. This is the happy path. And this is the unhappy path. And this is what I want to do is my finalization logic. It's just, it, all the bits of code are where I expect them to be. So this isn't just a win for Blazor. This is a huge win because C Sharp is awesome. There you go. Now you've got my opinion piece, whether you ask for it or not. All right, uh, talking about debugging. Now I showed this a little bit, debugging experiences, it's good, but it's not great. So in this example, I've got a, I've got a button. Now what happens if I click MK? Is anyone still, anyone still online? What should happen? What should happen when I click this button? Jeff M, you still there, Swampy Fox? Nope. Oh man, I hate it when I put my audience to sleep. All right. Uh, the answer is you hit this MK button and it goes over and calls set name, which calls a console dot right line as a five. It calls get zero, get zero returns zero, and oh, divide by zero exception. So you're going to get an exception. But I showed this in Visual Studio. I have a break on all exceptions turned on. So I would have expected that the cursor would sit right here on line 20 as soon as the, or sorry, no, on 25, on line 25, as soon as the exception has occurred, I would expect it to break on exceptions, but it doesn't do that. Instead, you end up with the runtime error of attempted to divide by zero. And it's even weirder because it, you, the, the users get this, an unhandled error has occurred and there's a reload button. The story gets a little bit better in .NET in 6, Blazor 6, but in days, Blazor 5 today, this is what happens. And it's it's kind of unpleasant. Like I really want to, I, re, I love this feature. I love this feature of Visual Studio being able to say, I want to break on exceptions and it just doesn't work in Blazor. So that's kind of a shame. And um, overall, I just prefer the debugging experience in Angular. But Blazor could get, could, could win that category so easily and probably will in the next version. So keep an eye open on that. As far as testability, this was a little test I wrote. I don't even know why I showed it. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, but tests are a first-class citizen in Blazor and they're a first-class citizen in Angular. And if you have any experience with Microsoft in the past, you might think, oh, this is going to be a, an Angular win, but it's not. The, the Blazor testing story is great. I've been really happy with it. And that is... That is something that might surprise you, but it is wonderful. Got to talk about interop. And I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the, uh, the story for Blazor is, is complicated with respect to interop. So imagine that you have code that you want to get to, and it lives in NuGet or it lives in NPM, and you're in Blazor or you're in Angular. If I were to build a little diagram of how hard things are to get in, if you're in one environment and you're trying to get code in another place um, or how often you're doing it, it would probably, well, it would look like this. So you got 
Blazor is really easy to get code from NuGet. Angular is really easy to get code from NPM. Blazor can get code from NPM, but Angular cannot get code from NuGet. So a very simple model looks like this. And so you might think, wow, Blazor can get code from everywhere and Angular can only get code from NPM. But that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a, a, a not, not entirely fair because how many Angular folks are there in the world that are like, man, there's that NuGet package that I really want to get that I just can't get access to. Um, it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> there's, there's, there's no Angular people that are really dying to get NuGet packages, but there are Blazor folks who are probably going to really need NPM packages because there's a lot of JavaScript packages in the world world that have been published, which have, uh, which are to, um, to, to Angular folks that are hard to get for Blazor. So this diagram would really look better if we adjusted these in terms of red and green. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's a ring, but if you're colorblind, I did try to um, demark this, but these ones are, are, this one's red and these ones are, are green. I put a little X by it. Um, but maybe we need to adjust the thickness of the lines to indicate how likely you are to do it. And, and if we do that, this diagram looks more like this. There are no Angular folks that are trying to get NuGet. And there are lots of Blazor folks that are trying to get Angular. But if you're trying to get NPM, you are going to have to do interop. It's going to be a lot of work. And so if there's a likelihood that you're pulling down third-party components from NPM, it's going to make your life so much harder in Blazor. So I guess I'd give the win to Angular here, just from the perspective of your life is going to be harder if you choose Blazor and you're interacting with third-party components. And that is something that you really need to think hard about if you're starting a new project. This is a big deal. And um, I love Blazor, but I would be a little bit still, even today, and for the in foreseeable future, I would just be a little bit hesitant until that story is a little bit better if I'm interacting with third-party third party components. If I'm just doing forms over data, Blazor's awesome. It just depends on how complicated you're, you're getting. Okay, so that, that category is, is a big one that's important. Last category here is code sharing. This is a, this is a really cool um, category and it's very specific to the Blazor, or, sorry, to the uh, Typer Shark game that I wrote. So in my Typer Shark game, here's how the architecture works. I have a game component. You've already saw, saw that. I showed it very briefly in the beginning of the presentation. And in there, I have a single player game engine adapter, which inherits from an iGame engine adapter. And the iGame engine adapter is what I actually ask for in the game component. component. And depending on whether in the very beginning they click single player or multiplayer is whether they end up with a single player game engine adapter or a multiplayer game engine adapter. And in the single player mode, I have a shared DLL. And the shared DLL is where the game engine lives. And the game engine's not super complicated, right? But it's also not super simple. It's got a bunch of timers because the sharks have a certain amount of time to swim across the screen. And sometimes they swim faster and sometimes they swim slower. And you've got to keep track of which letters have been typed, what the word is for each one of those sharks, whether the shark is alive or dead, and how many letters have, have been typed. And all of that information needs to be kept track of, and all those timers are going off. If, if timers happen in a certain order, then you lose the game. And if they happen in a different order, then you get points, and you have to keep track of your points. And all of that C sharp, I wrote without any regard whatsoever to whether it's running in a browser or whether it's running on the server. But here's the thing, when you're in multiplayer mode, you are having to, the, the state can't live just in your browser. It has to live up on a server. The state has to live on a server where the uh, server can keep track of how many different people there are that are connected and which sharks have been typed by which people because you don't want one person typing a different person's shark. And so you have sort of individual context, but a shared state. And so in this world, the game engine with all of its timers, it needs to live on the server. And so the way that I architected this project was I have this game engine 
being used by both the client project and the server project. And the server object asks for a multi-game engine event handler and events are passed back through to the game hub and back through signal R to the multiplayer game engine adapter. And the details of this aren't super important, but what's really cool about this is that this game engine that I wrote without any regard to whether it's living in a browser or whether it's living on a server in ASP.NET Core is simultaneously being run in both places at the same time. And anytime I make a change, if I were to make a change to the code in the game engine, it's gonna be deployed back out to both places. The exact same code can live in two and run in two completely different contexts. And I think this is just like the coolest thing ever that this ended up working. So uh, yeah, so that, and, and the shark game, by the way, it, it, if you drive through a tunnel, it's still gonna work when you're in single player mode. But if you drive through a tunnel when you're in multiplayer mode, it's obviously not because it's got a signal R connection, which is constantly long lived in, and connecting it to a game hub. So, I mean, can you do something like this in Angular? Yeah, sure, you can have Node. You can have a Node project and you can probably have JavaScript that maybe lives in both Node and it lives in the client. But um, I've never tried it, but I've talked to people that have said it doesn't work nearly as well as you think it's going to ever. Whereas this just works seamlessly. It worked beautifully out of the box. The c -sharp code worked perfectly in both places. Um, and that blew me away. I thought that was, and it worked so easily too. I didn't have to, really think about it. So that is code sharing and it is a huge win for Blazor. And you know, this might, you might not be building a game that needs to run either in client side or server, but you might have DTO objects and those DTO objects can live on both your server and on your client. And the attributes, the data annotation attributes, the required attribute for instance, can be validated both on the server and then it can be validated on the client. So that's a great example of code sharing and it is a huge win for Blazor. I love that feature. All right, kind of wrapping up here now. Um, it's 7.30, I don't know when I was supposed to officially wrap up, um, but the summary is which is the winner? If you were to start a brand new project today, who's gonna win? Probably not that guy in about five seconds, but uh, as far as Blazor and Angular, and it doesn't have to be Angular, this could be Vue or React. You're comparing Blazor to a different SPA component, really. It, I feel like if you're doing a mission critical application still today, or you're doing a really tight deadline, or you're something that uses a lot of JavaScript libraries and you're gonna do a lot of interop, or you just want something that's uh, absolutely stunningly beautiful, I still feel like I would personally choose Angular in those particular scenarios. But if you're just doing forms over data and with maybe a little bit of complexity and your application not super complicated, if you're doing hobby, CRUD work, um, or if you have NUCA dependencies, or if you're doing client and server code sharing that I, I showed, like then, um, or, you know, not, it doesn't have to be absolutely gorgeous, but good enough. I would definitely choose Blazor. So that is where I stand today. I'm a huge fan of Blazor. And I think when Blazor 6 comes out, um, I, I, would, I would lean even more towards putting more projects over here once Blazor 6 comes out. So keep a close eye on that because this technology is hot. It's really exciting and, um, and it's moving fast, which is, which is awesome. So that kind of concludes out my presentation. I hope this was helpful. Again, my name, Lee Richardson. You can uh, find me on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, uh, leeverson.com and LinkedIn. And these were all of the resources that I read or watched or, or used to prepare for this presentation. I tried to reference everybody. And thanks to Unsplash for all the stock photography that I used in the presentation. So uh, that, that concludes the presentation. I hope you all uh, found this useful. Any questions? Bring them on. I have this saying. Uh, Lee, you've been you've been in in this long enough. Uh, if you go back twenty five years, can we count how many millions of dollars Microsoft has spent so developers don't have to write JavaScript? <laughs> um, let's let's go back. <laughs> sure, sure. B but because before I, Blazor, we had what 
Silverlight. Yeah, Silverlight. Yeah, fair and enough. That's right, JavaScript, Silverlight. Yep. And true. That's why everyone loved it. Oh, I can build web apps and not write JavaScript. Web, web forms. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Web forms. Yeah. Actually, well, you still had a little bit of. No, no, that was really trying to get rid of JavaScript. Yeah. And what was interesting about web forms is they, you could write JavaScript. It just made it exponentially harder to write JavaScript. Like JavaScript, it wasn't a problem with JavaScript. Writing JavaScript in web forms was harder because you had to work in the. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, you did. In the shell of a web form. And you remember like, the Ajax, the Ajax panel? There's like something like Ajax panel or something like that, where they were, they were getting closer and closer to like trying to solve uh, partial page refreshes for you. And it just, oh, it was, it was hard. It was painful. Um, the story <laughs> I tell in Signal Mastery is uh, I had a client who had an ASP.NET web form and they had an update panel and that update panel would every second go refresh the view because they wanted to have a real time uh, interface. Oh, yeah, okay. And nothing wrong with that, except it was a four second um, database call to get all the data. So the one second was taking four seconds to respond. <laughs> and so it just was kicking off these calls left and right to update this update panel. Oh. And when they had when they came to me, uh, and they came to me specifically because they knew SignalR was the solution, they just yeah. didn't know how to do it. And I remember going into this, and they said, "Kevin, the the server that we're running on is just 100% all the time. Like <laughs> it's it never dips below 100%. And we're worried about bringing new new uh, new folks on. But yeah, yeah, you should be. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we did this whole refactoring the the .NET." And it was actually before .NET Core, so it was .NET full framework. And I remember deploying it, and we were bringing all these new folks on, and uh, our CPU was like 1%, um, just because it was doing the same amount of work, except yeah. we were doing, uh, we were pushing deltas down to the client instead of the client asking for data every second. Wow, they must have been ecstatic. <laughs> well, it's to the point where you think you broke it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I feel it really like working fifteen <laughs> percent CPU uh, process, but no, it was it was working really well. Um, and uh, yeah, I love telling that story because it you go you have to go way back. And I remember I remember using web forms and trying to write JavaScript, and you're pulling in thing like the things like the Telework tools or the Dev Express tools, and they I mean they just added to the problems. Like, hey, We'll help you not have to write JavaScript, okay? We promise. If you have to write JavaScript, it means we did something wrong. And it's like, oh yeah, you have a three meg view. Um, yeah, I bet that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, view state, whatever it was called, yeah. Yeah, the view state, yeah, Swampy Fox uh, brought up, yeah, the, oh no, Jeff M, massive. Here you're uh, using a script yeah. resource. Uh, yeah, the good old days, right? Um, yeah. Ajax Toolkit was a Dell. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about the Ajax Toolkit. The Ajax um, Toolkit, yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, bring out some bad memories. Um, but like nested update panels. Oh my gosh, I don't think I ever experienced having nested update panels. That sounds like an absolute disaster. No, nope. no, 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 no. No, it's just it's. If not, you know, there was a design back. meeting where someone said, "Oh, no one's ever going to use it that way, right?" Like that's not what it's designed for, because um, I think what people didn't realize about update panels is it would re-render the entire page, but only update the update panel. Wait, really? Yeah. Did it work that way? That's generally how update panels work. Is you had to you had to go through the entire page lifecycle. Um, oh, that's why you did the if not page that is post back because you'd inadvertently hit that if you were. Yeah, I remember now. I remember you're right. There's a good reason why people made a lot of money back then, <laughs> because like that. And it's also why it's also why things like uh, uh, Node.js and uh, Rails and stuff probably came up because if Microsoft had had a better experience, you wouldn't have to go and buy, invent entire frameworks. <laughs> um, that partly, that. partly. I mean, the, a lot of the tooling wasn't great either. I mean, did you ever use Java Server Pages? Like that was. That was not so. That was not so hot either, really. Now everyone was, was like, 
equally bad at it. Um, <laughs> Because they were but, trying to do too much. Maybe right? maybe web forms especially. <laughs> web forms. But, I mean, web forms, man, web forms just, yeah, really try to just keep adding and adding to it. I remember when they announced MVC, like the beta version of MVC. I forgot what it was called. Oh, yeah. um, it was like, it was, it, well, the story was Scott Goo was on a plane. It's like, oh, what was a non web forms version of ASP.NET look like and wrote it on a plane? Uh, and then said, all right, here's version one, go go nuts with it. Didn't, didn't they just steal that out from Rails at the time? I think it was heavily influenced from Rails. Okay. Um, that, all right, the, the web forms model is like, all right, there are 20 steps involved in rendering a web page. There shouldn't be that many steps. There should be like three um, for a basic website. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is funny to say, because think about an ASP.NET Core um, pipeline. <laughs> all right, go to your startup CS. So, all right, well, I have like- Oh, oh yeah, and the, the global, there was a global dot- uh, ASAX, yep. ASAX, that's it, yeah, global dot ASAX, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, I remember, oh. oh, and yeah, and code could hide in there and do terrible, terrible things, yeah. But it was really useful when you said, all right, I need to inject some logic after the view is rendered, but before it's delivered to the, uh, to the client. All right, you just override that event and you do whatever you wanted to. Um, in ASP.NET Core, it's, it's a little bit more effort if you need to inject logic anywhere. Oh, it's a little more effort, but I love that pipeline. I love being able to, yeah, just like, I want to be at this point in the pipeline. And then after the next component has returned, then I maybe want to adjust it a little bit. Like, oh, you got so much power. I really am. A, I'm a big fan. Yeah, me too. I feel like they're really moving in a good direction. Oh, man. Oh, so many memories. Um, <laughs> all right. Swamp A. Just prior to MVC, there was a patterns practice library for implementing MVP. Yes, um, uh, yes, I remember that. I didn't use it. Um, wasn't there also, there were a couple open source libraries that would, uh, like, wasn't Nancy um, uh, an MVP pattern um, before MVC came out? I, yeah, yeah, Hanselman was, Hanselman was pushing that for a while. I remember that, but I don't think I ever got into it. I Me neither. It it's Nancy and Sinatra. Yep. Yeah. Sinatra. Yeah. I, I may be showing my age, but I, I first got into .NET about uh, .NET MVC 2 or 3-ish. Yeah. Um, and those, that was still very early in the MVC. Not a lot of people were really adopting it then. But I remember seeing a lot of talk about web forms and a lot of it was first thing you do with the new web forms application, disable the view state. Yeah. Well, there were legitimate uses for view state. The problem, um, I did this talk a long time ago and it was on how to build more performant web forms. And we had an entire discussion on view state. And the problem with view state is you didn't want, there were a lot of components you would put on your screen that would use view state, but didn't need to use view state. Mm -hmm. um, so it was generally a better practice to disable view state for the page and then select into it on components that had to manage view state, um, which is easier said than done. <laughs> it's like, you're almost better off uh, like disabling it at the, or not, what is it? Disable it at the application level and then you can selectively, selectively enable it on individual components. Um, but there was always this problem of, um, well, if I type something in the box, uh, so I have an input box, I type something in there, send that to the server, the server does something with it and sends a response back. Well, we need to populate the box with what was originally in it. And the only way you could do that technically was with view state. View state, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> because the view state was the piece that would tell web forms, well, here's what was in the box populate it, send it back. So we, we always know what's in the box. And right. Right. Cause it was, they were trying to get it to look like wind forms. They wanted it to feel like, like wind forms used to feel and oh, that designer, man, they, they did good an okay job. If that was their goal, it just fell down quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I don't remember when Razor was first introduced to NBC. Oh, yeah. Which was a nice day. Razor was, uh, I, it was NBC3, I think. Um, like, NBC3 was solid. Uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying I would still do future development on NBC3. Uh, if, but if it was my only option, it was a solid option. Um, uh, Swampy, the story for web forms was in Microsoft was trying to get WinForm developers on the web. Because uh, we go back, what, early 2002, 2003? Because mm-hmm. um, they had classic ASP, which was separate. And then eventually it became ASP.NET. And they, were, they had all these folks with WinForms development experience. And they wanted to get those folks in web forms. Because, I mean, if you were a WinForms developer, you didn't want to build web apps. Because web apps weren't cool yet. Right. That wasn't the thing that people were doing. They wanted their thick app clients with installers and all that crud, Battleship Gray. Um, and you have to admit, I mean, that VB6 uh, WinForms experience was amazing. Like, considering that was in like 99, 2000 or whatever, like, that was a great development experience. That's why still people today are, uh, yeah, I had a developer a couple of years ago who was, who was building an app, a side app, and he was like, file, new, WinForms. Yeah. Really? <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> I've seen people do some magical things with WinForms. Um, my first, my first .NET app uh, when let's see, I joined a consultancy in two thousand six, two thousand seven, and that's when I started learning .NET. And it was a WinForms on .NET two. .NET two, yeah, and uh, it was. It was all wind forms and it was magical. Like you, all right, you need to make a change. Let's go view, pull up the view. Uh, let's make our change. All right, let's go to code behind. Let's make the code behind changes. You can't, I kind of miss how simple that was. <laughs> that just worked extremely well. Yeah. And the, and the component libraries were amazing. Uh, we used, we used Dev Express or I think we used Del, Dev Express or Telric on one of our apps, and like their tool sets were solid. They they had the they had really good support. They worked insanely well. Uh, they were customizable. Um, yeah, I loved them to death. Move into and then move into the web. I remember building my first web app um, for that same company. It was, it was a process. Um, yeah. it was all web forms. Good old web forms. Oh. So many memories. But. Well, I, I mean, I really feel like Blazor is getting very close to uh, the, the the lofty goal of getting yeah. back to 1999. <laughs> I, I continue to be uh, impressed with Blazor. Um, the The problem I have is it's a me problem. It's I cannot convince my brain to want to do Blazor um, because. I have jumped that hurdle of becoming a somewhat proficient HTML and JavaScript developer and understanding that ecosystem mm-hmm. um, well enough where I would have to, it would be difficult for me to, to it's why um, it was difficult for me to jump to TypeScript when TypeScript first came out because I knew how to write JavaScript. I was actually pretty good at writing JavaScript, but moving to TypeScript required me to work backwards like i had to untranslate the javascript i knew to write the typescript to compile or transpile to the javascript that i wanted it to write um so it was like these mental hurdles to get the end result that i wanted um blazer kind of feels like the same way it's like well i i know how to write this um and moving to blazer's like all right well now i know how to get the end result I know how to get the end result quickly in the thing I need the end result to be in HTML and JavaScript. Let me write that in C sharp <laughs> razor and it's working backwards again. Um, so while there might, while there might be benefits of that, it's hard for me to make those mental jumps um, to, to get to that point. It's like, all right, well, I could, I could write in blazer or I could, write in five minutes and view and I'll be done <laughs> like because I know how to do that um same thing with angular or react I, uh, I know how to jump those hurdles I know how to get my end result um but I'm continuously impressed with the blazer demos I see 
Um, I remember seeing Blazer. Uh, were you at the MVP Summit when he showed us? It wasn't called Blazer then. It was called something else. Um, we saw our first demo of Blazer. Uh, so Steve Sanderson. I've heard about this. I was, I've only recently been awarded that MVP. So were you? Okay. So, all right. So you haven't actually been to a summit, uh, like a real summit. Not a real one, not in person. Okay. So um, this is not NDA or anything like that. So at summit, usually the way summit works is you, you have a couple days, they bring all the MVPs in and you basically go around. It's like a conference. You just go to whatever session you want to sit in. And sometimes you, you, you always get a couple things on the schedule are like, all right, David Fowler, uh, Fowler and Damien Edwards are going to talk about something. All right, that's a packed session. Uh, of Scott, Scott yeah. Guthrie is going to just talk about whatever he wants to talk about. That's a packed session. Yep. Um, but then you have others like Steve Sanderson. Steve Sanderson says, I'm just going to show you something I'm working on. And that's a packed session. Yeah. And uh, it's where we first saw, it wasn't Steve, it was David Fowler. He showed us K, which K eventually turned into .NET Core. Um, and oh, I remember seeing cool. that for the first time and just going, what? Hey, that's amazing. Um, but he showed his blazer uh, or Steve Sanderson showed his blazer. He's like, Hey, what if I could run C sharp in the browser as web assembly? And let me, he whips up a demo and it's like, well, huh? <laughs> that's, <Yeah>. that's amazing. <laughs> so, um, but what I think people don't realize is this, everything that we have today, like Blazor, .NET Core, or .NET 5, .NET 6, is all thanks to Serverlight. <laughs> like, if we didn't have oh, Serverlight, right. we would never have had anything we have today. Because uh, Serverlight was that initial push cross to plat. build a cross-platform version of the right, .NET right. framework. Um, so I, I, like, I don't know how much of that original code still is, is running. But now, why, do, why do you think they didn't go with mono? I mean, why why was why was mono and uh, .NET Core like why have those become two separate things? Well, I, I know they're kind of phasing out the um, one, but well, mono basically. I mean, what we have today is kind of what mono. It, it is mono uh, because .NET or uh, Microsoft basically took over that project. Uh, they brought uh, what's his name. Um, he joined Microsoft. So then that's also why we're calling it .NET 5 and not .NET Core anymore. And because uh, .NET 5 encompasses the Xamarin, the, the, the .NET um, Core libraries. It's the UI language. Um, I think they're so. going to finally get rid of it. They're going to finally get rid of it in that, in that version. Because when I, when I run Cake, when I run my Cake scripts, I got another presentation if you ever want to uh, do yeah. a, a presentation on Cake, C Sharp Make. And, um, and in that, when you run as .NET Framework, if you select, you can have different runners. And when you select it as, as .NET Framework and you want it to be able to run on a Mac or Linux, which I often do, .NET Framework and Linux only works with Mono. So I still have... I still have to install Mono um, on my build server. Really? Hmm. My build server is on Linux. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 because there are certain Cake plugins that have to require .NET standard. And so the only way you can do it is, is that. So, but I think with, with .NET 5, that will come, that shouldn't be or .NET 6, that will completely go away. And I think that's technically, that shouldn't have been a problem with .NET Core 3. Because um, if I recall correctly, .NET Core 3, was a version of .NET Core that would have successfully implemented every uh, every assembly missing from uh, .NET Full Framework that they were going to port. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's the key distinction. There are things in .NET Full Framework that they did not bring over to .NET Core. Um, there are things that were changed, like the security, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in security changes. I've yeah. run into that recently. For the better, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get Barry Dorans on the call and let him talk about security. Um, but uh, so yeah, long story short, it's it's all it's all better. We're going through like growing pains right now as a community. So yeah. So Jr. Penn Darvis, if you are interested, I, I I can do a presentation on Cake. So that's that's C sharp make, which is uh, basically being able to take all of your 
uh, I don't know, you might today use PowerShell scripts or mm -hmm. you might today use rake files or you might um, do everything in Azure DevOps as draggy droppy things or do it in all <laughs> giant YAML files. But there is an alternative and it's a really cool alternative and it is building all of your build scripts in C Sharp. And that project is called Cake and it's worth checking out. It's uh, cakebuild.net. And um, I've got all of my DevOps scripts in there and I can run them all locally rather than um, having to run them on the server, which is really convenient. I can set breakpoints and all that stuff. It's, it's cool stuff. Well, speaking of upcoming talks, uh, we have, see, next month is May. Uh, we have Kevin Jones. Lee, you know Kevin Jones. Kevin Jones sure is do. that guy. He's one of those guys that when he starts talking, you instantly feel like you've never programmed before because he is at a level that is 15 times higher than you will ever be. Um, and he is going to talk to us about Stack Alec, uh, <laughs> which, uh, let's see, let me read this. Oh, he's going to go into some of the details of Span, of uh, Span of T. And Ooh, uh, cool. Cool. Uh, which is a cool keyword that I don't understand well enough to use in a yeah. same way. Sadly, um, I am yeah, the same boat. Uh, it's one of those like, oh, I think I have a use case where I should use span. And everything I've ever read says, unless you're on the .NET team, you don't have a reason to use span. <laughs> so, all right, well, if you say so. Um, so yeah, Kevin Jones will be here next month. That should be a great session. Um, and... Yeah, we're booked up through June. Drew, we got to open up some more spots so we can get some more folks on the list. We'll get Lee back to do his cake talk. Yeah, I'll start doing that this weekend. Yep. Uh, let's, let's see. May, June. Yep. And then June, we have Linda Nichols. She's a good friend of the user group. She's going to talk about something. We don't know what. Uh, oh, possibly Azure Durable Functions, which is a lot of fun if you haven't used them before. So... Cool. All right. Uh, all right. Well, friends, thank you everyone out in Twitch land for hanging out with us. Uh, thank you, Lee, for hanging out with us today. It was a great Thanks talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're not following and all that good stuff, make sure you're following. And uh, we will see you all again next month. Um, all right. See you later, folks. All right, live stream is off and the recording.